What's up guys, welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit, this is your host, Zach, and today's subreddit is r slash pro revenge. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode. This story's called, Cross Post from Tales from the Front Desk. I thought she was checking in for a one night stand. Boy was I glad to be wrong. I posted this originally at r slash tales from the front desk and was told I should share it on here as well. This is some secondhand revenge as I was more of a spectator than anything else. Enjoy and let me know if I might be on the wrong revenge subreddit. Ah! Note, this is Primodello slash stay at home slash quarantine. Glossary. Distressed passengers are flight passengers from an airline who had to cancel or delay a flight for whatever reason and have been redirected to a hotel to stay at while they wait for the next flight, however long that might be. I had been working as a front desk agent for about a week. It's my first time working at a hotel. So I'm still learning the ropes, even though I'd previously worked as a check-in agent for a cruise line. I'm working the afternoon shift and things have been pretty slow. A couple of check-ins here and there, but that's about it. It's about 7 p.m. when this lady, we'll call her Libby, comes in and after talking things out at the valet, makes her way over to me. We exchange greetings and she tells me she would like to reserve a room, but only for a couple of hours. Obviously, we're not a motel, so I let her know the minimum of time she could reserve a room for would be a full night. After asking what the price would be, $240, which is way too much for the kind of hotel I work at, by the way, she agrees and hands me her credit card. This is where things get weird. As soon as I ask her for her ID to make the reservation, Libby backtracks and says that she doesn't want her name anywhere on the reservation and would like to make it under the name of the guy who would be joining her later. Instead, I pause for a moment, and after asking her again if she was planning on using the room as well, I tell her that I at least need to put her name into the accompanying list for the room. I reassure her that only the employees would be able to see said list and that no, the guy she was planning to meet wouldn't see it. I would like to make it very clear that throughout this whole interaction, Libby has been super composed, kind, and understanding. At this point, however, I'm just thinking she's here for a one-night stand and doesn't want the dude to know anything about her because she's probably married or something. Which I can work with, sure, but why not just actually get a motel, lady? This theory of mine is further solidified when Libby asks me to make a note in the reservation so that if any point we need to address her by her name around the dude, we wouldn't call her by her real name and instead she gives me a fake name, or so I thought, to address her by. At this point, I'm obviously bewildered but still trying to be accommodating and trying really hard to not let it show how much I'm trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Haha, <laughs> my butt fell off. We go through the rest of the check-in process and she even goes as far as showing me a pic of the dude so I'll know who he is when he comes in. I hand her the key and she heads to her room. About an hour later, mystery dude walks in. Let's call him Jake. My coworker, who has no clue of anything, ends up checking him in, so I don't really get to see much of Jake. To be honest, at this point, I still wasn't giving the whole thing much thought other than, that's a bit weird. <laughs> Not even 30 minutes have passed since Jake went up when Libby comes back down and hands me both keys. They'd both received one each. Says thank you in the most serious yet cordial way and then walks off. Multiple thoughts went through my mind as this lady was making her way to the valet. That was way too fast, even for a quickie. Why the heck did she give me two keys? Where's Jake? Libby, please tell me you didn't murder Jake. Security is standing behind me, staring Libby down, probably having the same thought process as I am. The supervisor for security usually spends the night hanging out at the front desk. My coworker and I are whispering with each other, still trying to figure out what the heck happened because that did not look like a lady who had just had a pleasant romp in the sheets. Cue Jake coming down the stairs and okay. We can breathe, he's not dead. Now, what happened next, we couldn't see because we suddenly had an onslaught of distressed passengers. Like 30, I wanted to die. So I thought I wouldn't find out what the heck had actually happened between Libby and Jake. But then, the worker from the valet came over and boy did he have some tea to spill. Turns out that Libby had gone as far as asking valet guy to park her car in a way that the license plate wouldn't be visible. Why? Because turns out that Jake is Libby's husband. And you might be asking yourself by this point, why has this lady gone through so much trouble to hide anything that might give her identity away from her husband? 
Well, dear reader, because the alias that Libby gave me just so happened to be the name of the girl Jake was cheating on her with. This woman, somehow, got her cheating ass husband to believe that his girlfriend had booked them a sweet, sweet night at the hotel only for him to show up and find his wife sitting on the bed instead. This badass mother fornication under consent to the king of a woman came back downstairs after probably massacrating the heck out of this idiotic boy with not a hair out of place and calmly had the valet bring both of their cars back and then patiently waited for Jake Schmeg to get his sorry ass back to the lobby so that she could extend her hand and demand their house keys from him. She then got into her car and just drove away. The only thing that would have made this even better was if Jake Schmeg's girlfriend had also been there to tear into him as well. I like to think she had a part to play in this whole thing, since how else would Libby have managed to trick him into getting to the hotel? Point is, this woman is all I aspire to be. You know what? A lot of people might go the crazy route, because honestly, cheating on your spouse is like one of the worst things you could honestly do. And you would be absolutely within your right to feel the urge to absolutely grab their neck and snap it. However, you don't want them to have the satisfaction of knowing that you hurt them a lot. But no, this, this woman, she actually thought this out and was methodical. And yeah, she probably screamed him a new one, but that's, that's just a normal fight. I mean, not normal fight, a bad fight, but she, he was cheating on her. And she caught him red-handed. Yet she maintained her relative chill and left the hotel with an aura of badassery. Alrighty, Roo, this story's called Cross Post from Malicious Compliance. Don't tell people how to do their job if you don't know how it should be done. As the title says, this was originally posted in Malicious Compliance, but I was suggested to post it here. If it doesn't belong here, but as soon as it is, let me know. Standard warnings. I ain't a native English speaker, so don't eat me over poor spelling and grammar. So, backstory. I used to work at a factory who suffered severely under a director who wanted to make more money with little idea as to how you run a factory or how to see through people trying to BS you to gain favor. One person in particular was notorious for licking buttholes. When I started, he was the boss for about a third of the production unit. And as it happened, he was also the guy who took over whenever my own boss needed time off, was out liaising with other companies, or otherwise wasn't on company grounds. This guy had a massive superiority complex and couldn't handle being wrong or having made a mistake. And just to make it better, he was also clueless about quite a lot of things outside the machine shop where he was the boss. Safe to say, my partner and I really disliked him and made an active effort to work against his stupidity whenever he was our acting boss. So as for the story itself, my partner and I made up the company's goods reception and quality control department. Basically, our job was to receive goods and inspect that everything was in order. Correct amount had been delivered, no transport or production damage or mistakes, and then prepare the things for storage. But as you might expect, sometimes things weren't quite in order. Some things were unimportant and we just ignored them. Most things we send in to get them repaired. Since most mistakes were fixable and then send a bill to the contractor who were hired for the job, and a few things we discarded because they were broken beyond what we could repair. And this particular ass clown was allowed to green light things that my partner and I had sent in to get repaired. So one day, the director comes out with the head of productions behind him, wanting to know why a particular type of good from a particular contractor always got sent in for a pair, and I do mean every time. And we explain that because Purchase opted to use the cheapest place to get these things done, quite frankly one particular part was subpar, but it could be fixed so it really wasn't a big deal. He wasn't happy with that explanation and wanted to get someone who knew of such things to have a look at it. Cue Mr. Ass Clown himself, who takes one look at them and goes, Oh, those? Those are freaking perfect, right as they're supposed to be. And director tells us to just send them on their way. My partner, a fairly temperamental guy, was furious, but we made a plan. And so Ass Clown and director left, but head of productions stayed behind. With every piece of good we received, 
we'd pull the schematics in order to measure if everything was in order or not. And then on this schematic, we'd write some additional information, purchase number, steel certificate, etc., so that we could easily trace everything back, should there be a problem. And for this particular thing, we drew an arrow to the part that was done incorrectly, wrote what the problem was, and approved by Mr. Ass Clown. Asked the production manager to sign it, and off the goods went. Five minutes later, we got a call from storage. So, uh, what's the deal with these goods? Why aren't they in the machine shop? Well, because Mr. Ass Clown said they're okay, and the director is backing them up. Insert curse words. We then briefed him on the plan, and he was somewhat happy. So, about two weeks later, our trap sprung. Our assembly unit, whom I'd already spoken to, needed these particular parts, and they received the ones that weren't made correctly. So, of course, they contacted their boss, who, according to plan, didn't contact my boss, since he was away, but the director himself about how quality control had really messed up. Of course, the director came flying over, howling and screaming about our incompetence, to which my partner and I calmly asked him, so it's about those specific parts creating this particular problem. Well, yes, you bloody morons. The director then called for Mr. Ass Clown to come and straighten us out. Mr. Ass Clown stood there, all smug, expecting his next big promotion, but we called storage, and asked our storage worker to bring up the pallet with the remaining goods, and the schematic that had a very neatly approved by Mr. Ass Clown signed production manager written on it. The half a second it took him to realize that these goods that risked delaying the shipment, and thus costing a small fortune in delays, had been green-lighted by him, was priceless. His face went from Oh yeah, I'm securing my seat as the next production manager, to Oh God, I'm gonna get fired for this. He was later told to stay right away from the quality control department, and my partner and I, as well as our boss, celebrated with cake. <sighs> they complied with malice, and indeed, it did backfire on Mr. Booty Booty Clown. Also, I'm curious, what is an ass clown? Is it a donkey that is a clown? Or is it uh, up someone's butt? Or a clown for someone's butt? I, I'm confused. Someone explain the logistics of this, please. This story's called Never Cheat for Your Child. I've been following this thread for some time, and I just have to say I absolutely love the stories here. I was hoping I could make a contribution, then I remembered this little incident from back in my high school days. I hope you guys like it. It sort of spills over to different topics, including r slash entitled parents, r slash petty revenge, and r slash entitled kids. So I've also posted this story there with this little disclaimer in case you've seen this or this story sounds familiar anyway. On with the story. So back in high school, I was classmates with a kid who, well, wasn't exactly the sharpest tool in the shed. Take note, we were sophomores, grade 10, by now so our batch had been together for 10 years. It's a small private school, so we were all pretty tight-knit. However, his mom believed he was the perfect little angel, who would outshine everyone else. In reality, he only got those since his mom would bribe their way through the system to let the kid have the benefits. I.e., instead of trying out, the mom would pay their way into sports teams so he'd get credit only for him to be benched the entire game. The worst part was that as the years went by, and to this day, honestly, the kid bought into his mom's narrative and believed he was superior to many of us, with the mom making many outlandish claims. Among these tactics were something I'd noticed for a while. See, in the Philippines, instead of dividing the academic year into semesters, we had quarters, and within each quarter, we had two major long tests. Henceforth, I'll be referring to as LTs. Then, after each quarter, we had a quarterly exam. Henceforth, I'll be referring to as QEs. As each quarter progresses, the QEs would aggregate lessons from the quarters that had passed along with that quarter's lessons. Anyway, for some time now, our class had noticed that this kid would call sick on the day of major exams, then the mom would call on the kids in the higher bracket grading who were supposedly close with the kid to ask for the exact content of the tests so they could study it for the retest. Now, I'm not exactly a star student, okay, not at all, but my grades were decent enough for her to consider me within that call list. I mean, I hung out with the guy and he was nice enough until his mom began inflating his ego. So, for the third quarter exam, for algebra, surprise surprise, the kid calls in sick. Now, this was pretty expected since everyone had already been betting on it. Sure enough, by evening, the mom calls me up asking exactly what was on the test. 
each question and answer. I tell her off and she starts spouting on about grades are important and I'm just caring for the future of my child and he deserves to be in the honor society and you should be more charitable. Ugh, okay, whatever lady. By this point, I'd had enough, so I comply, but with a twist. I end up giving her all the items of our second quarter exam. Without a thought, she begins typing it down. I can hear her frantic fingers on the keyboard through the phone and begins taking down each and every word I say. Here's the kicker. Our algebra teacher did not even include the lessons from the past quarter exams. She thanks me profusely and how I'm such a saint and a savior to her son. Ah, quit the sweet talk, lady. Anyway, kid comes in, takes the test and, oh, look, he got an F. To add insult to injury, our teacher was one who'd put in the numerical percentage, so we had a clear idea on how we did. Kid got a 35%. The mom confronts me and says, You lied! What you told me wasn't on the test! I played the ignorance card and said, Hmm, maybe he switched it up. They never bothered me again. <laughs> He dropped from the honor society that year. People caught wind of the story and started doing the same thing. Parents never spoon feed your kids. It never works out well. We're in college now and all updates on the kid's college life are non-existent. We don't even know if he's in college. Every time we have a reunion, he's evasive on the topic, despite everyone openly talking about their ups and downs on uni life. Last we heard, the mom was claiming her little Einstein was taking a double degree. We have a classmate whose uncle is a professor in said degrees and he said he's never heard of the kid there. So that's my story. Yeah. Hope you guys liked it. You know what? I liked it. And that woman is very trusting of some like middle age, middle school, not middle age, middle school, high school age kids memories. Like honestly, you'd have better luck trying to steal an answer key or something like that's ridiculous. Do not trust someone's memory like that. Don't forget to like, subscribe and hit that bell to never miss an episode.